Christ, of my higher power, I recognize my spiritual attributes that are mine through divine grace. Here I find the strength I seek, the love that sustains me, and the peace to soothe my soul. As I move back into my day, I take those elements with me. I am renewed in mind and heart. Keep in silence, O oh here, O oh Israel, Deuteronomy 27. Trusting this 
loving force that's always guiding us. And just as your body has relaxed, take just a moment and look at your thoughts. See what's there in your mind right now. Thoughts, ideas, concerns. And realize that you have the power and the choice for your mind to become empty, as difficult as it may seem. Continue to let your mind unwind as each thought falls away. Whatever appears there, gently acknowledge it and allow it to fall away into the emptiness. As best you can, allow your mind to become still and quiet, empty, open. Begin to notice the space between your thoughts growing. Begin to notice this gap. Gap is the entryway into your true self, who you really are, timeless, ageless, created in the image and likeness of God, in complete and total perfection. within you in the stillness where nothing is impossible. There is a place within you where there is no sickness, no sorrow, no sadness, no death. There is only joy. There is only love. And you only find this place in the silence. place of stillness we are only grateful as we breathe in the very breath of God and the life of God and the love of God with gratitude knowing that nothing that has ever happened in this world has changed who you are a perfect beloved child of God you remain held in the mind of God in the hands of grace you are still exactly as God created you, no matter where your journey has taken you, whatever the circumstances of your life may be. So we breathe in deeply, opening our hearts and opening our minds, ready to accept a new, beautiful idea about ourselves, Letting go of all perceived lack and limitations, accepting ourselves as the magnificent expressions of life. We find this in the stillness where we rest. And for this sacred time together, we say, thank you, God. And so it is.
Let's just all take a big, deep breath together as we continue to become centered <coughs> Excuse me. right here in this moment. Ah. <sighs> You all look so lovely. Oh, I'm happy to be here. It seems like this month just really flew by. It just seems like I was just standing here, right? <laughs> but I'm very happy to be here. And we were spying on my my home church where I'm a minister at Unity of Matter in the New Orleans area. They start at 1030. And we streamed live our um, service. So I got to spy on them for a few minutes to see how they were doing. And I say that. Because as we move forward with the evolution of this spiritual community, you too will soon be stream, streaming your service out into the world. It is so exciting. I can't tell you how exciting it is to know that anyone, anywhere in the world can tune in and watch our service. And to hear these truths and to feel the love and to experience the music. Because there are many people that have never even heard of these ideas, these very liberating ideas that we kind of take for granted, many of us, because we've heard of them so much. So it was fun spying. They were doing a really good job. <laughs> we were talking earlier about how, you know, church attendance is a very interesting thing, and I just gave up trying to figure it out a long time ago. Um, you know, Mother's Day is usually a huge day for us, and although it was a nice crowd, it was smaller. And then last Sunday was just a regular Sunday, and we had tornado warnings in New Orleans, flash flood warnings. They said, do not get on the streets, stay in your house. I mean, I was about to grab my cats and like go into the bathroom. They said, get in the bathtub. I was like, I don't have a tub, I'll just stand in the shower with cats. Claw me to death. Um, but I decided to go onto the church, which is about a 15 minute drive from my house, just in case someone showed up, just so I would be there in case someone was crazy enough to get out and flash flood warnings and tornadoes to come to church. And would you believe that on that very day when I expected no one that we had over 25 people came through the floods? I was like, are you guys crazy? I was like, on a beautiful day or even a regular day, we want you to come in and then you're out doing something and then on the day that there's tornadoes, you fly into church. I said, maybe you feel safe here. I don't know. But it's just so interesting, you know, trying to figure it out because we're saying it's Memorial Day. How many people will come? How many people? Well, we are exactly where we need to be. So thank you for listening to the call. The exact group of people that are supposed to be here are here. There is total perfection in the universe, even though it doesn't always seem that way or feel that way. Because we do have rough patches, right? Does anybody not have any rough patches? I want to talk to you after the service. <laughs> we all have those. So I had an interesting, um, oh, and I was going to say one more thing before I roll into the talk. Um, so everyone got there. We were sitting down ready for church, ready to stream the service, and we completely lost power. <laughs> we're sitting in the dark. And luckily the air conditioner had been on since early that morning. We have a group that meets in the morning, a recovery group. And I said, leave the air on so that when we get there, it's freezing. Because when bodies get in there, it's, you know, it cups, sucks up the air. So fortunately it was nice and cool and we completely lost power. So we're sitting in the dark. Um, everybody, two people that loved to projects jumped up and started grabbing candles, like automatically. They just went on autopilot. And we do have a real piano in our congregation. You can't use microphones, you can't use a keyboard when that happens. So we pulled, rolled out the big piano, and it ended up being the most beautiful service. Everyone came and made a semi-circle. Um, there were no microphones, no lights, it was only candles, and the, like a real piano. And about 10 of those 25 people came up and said, we need to do this more often. So now we are instigating what we're calling the second sacred Sunday service. So the second Sunday of every month is going to be a candlelit service on Sunday morning. <laughs> Very exciting. And you know, with church, as you know, as you're doing here, it's great to put things in and mix things up. And when you listen to the Spirit, you get these ideas. So what could have been, you know, just a crazy morning ended up being so, so beautiful. And right when we finished and we were saying the prayer protection, there come the lights on. <laughs> and uh, it was just like a perfect, perfect day. And um, inspired us to start something brand new, which everybody's all excited about. 
We're also getting ready to celebrate our 41st anniversary next month. So uh, this church has been in the New Orleans area for 41 years. Isn't that, isn't that crazy? Four years. So we rent out our church a lot. You know, church economics makes no sense. You know this if you've been on a board or a minister. If you, I don't even know if you've ever thought about this before. But in a church, you still have to pay your bills. You still have to pay the mortgage. You still have to pay all the expenses that go along with it. But unlike other businesses that are open all week long and they're generating income, you're basically using this space for two hours. But you're still having to pay for seven days' worth. Now, economically, that makes no sense. That would be like a shoe store saying, we're only going to sell shoes for two hours on Sunday morning, and the rest of the week we're closed. And we hope we make enough during that time to, you know, to offset all our expenses. So, as many churches do, we rent out our space a lot. It's, there's someone there on Sunday day, and on Sunday, four different groups uh, meet there. So, we also have a church that shares with us. They come on Sunday evening and have their service, and then they also have a Wednesday night prayer service after our meditation, and we have a Course in Miracles group on Wednesday after our meditation. And so... This group, this church, really um, has taught me a lot. Um, and I'll say that by practicing, many of you may know that my parents were Pentecostal ministers. Um, like I said, full recovery is expected. But, um, <laughs> but they were Pentecostal ministers, and many years ago, when I first got to the church I'm at now, uh, many, five years ago, I've been there six and a half, but about five years ago, we got a phone call one day, and this woman on the other end said, we want to come and rent your church. And I was like, would you like to come look at it? No, we want to rent it. We looked it up in the phone book. Actually, they went online. They said, God said that love was here, so we're going to come and rent from you. And I was like, really? So they came. I said, do you want to come look at the space? They said, no, we're coming today to have a service. I'm like, oh, all right, well, come on. I told them what the price was, and they were happy with that. And you know when they walked in the door? I uh, shook their hands and they, we all greeted and there were some members there that were volunteering to clean out this little back room. And they said, well, we're actually a Pentecostal church. I thought, now how, what? Spirit has such a, a funny sense of humor. And it made total sense to me that it comes full circle back around. You know, it's full circle back around and helped me to complete my healing and see that everybody's on their perfect path. It was just, I laughed. And I thought, wow, this is such, Spirit is so sneaky. Like, so sneaky. But the funny thing happened, they decided, they were so thrilled to have the space, they thought it was beautiful. And I tried to explain to them, I said, you see up there that tablet, it has all the world's religions, so we honor all religions. They're like, we don't care. I said, you know what you're getting into when you come here? I was kind of like, you know this is unity. And they're like, we don't care. It was just, you know, just the strangest but wonderful thing. I said, well, if you're okay with everything, you know, um, and they have this big, huge wooden cross that they um, keep in the back, and it's got purple lights on it. And they're so sweet and so gentle-hearted during Easter. They said, if you would like during your service, you can use the purple lights and the cross for Easter if you would like. And I said, we're fine. We're good. But um, such a wonderful group. Well, with the back to the story. So we, they came and they showed up. The volunteers were there. And one of the volunteers in particular had never been exposed to this type of service mm -hmm. and this type of activity. And, but I had. I grew up in it. And so I knew we were in trouble when the minister said, and now we're going to pray. We're going to thank God for this opportunity and this blessing because we love this space. Thank you, God. Well, I knew what was coming. We got in a circle, and he started hollering and squealing and speaking in tongues and bucking around and all this kind of stuff. And one of the older women who had never seen anything like that was just horrified. Her eyes got like this big. I'm like, hey, just come down. It's going to be okay. And he's carrying on, you know. And, and, um, and so when they left, she said, I need to talk to you, Jack. First of all, we need to get a contract, which we do. You know, everything's in writing, so we know. So, and you need to put in the contract that no farm animals are allowed in the sanctuary. <laughs> I'm like, where did that come from? I have no idea. And um, and so now they've been there for five years, and they, with their money that they pay joyfully, it's a win-win. It pays almost our entire, um, we don't own, but our lease for the month. So it's a win-win for everybody. So I had something interesting happen with their minister, now that we're good friends. I was in the office, which usually is locked when they're there, and I was there before they started start doing something, and he came into the office. And he had this funny look on his face, and I said, oh, what's he looking at? He's either seeing something about chakras or, you know, or something. He had this look, and I'm like looking around, and the only thing I saw was this picture of Jesus, and I said, well, we're good. But he still just kept looking, and I finally said, um, is everything okay? He said, 
I'm looking at this picture of Jesus. I've never seen a picture of a happy Jesus. Oh, wow. I've never seen, I said, well, this is my favorite picture of Jesus. This is actually called Laughing Jesus. Many of you have maybe seen this particular yes. one. It's a beautiful, it looks like it was originally like a, um, some kind of watercolor or something, but I've, you know, a print of it. And it's just beautiful. It's Jesus' face as we imagine it in makeup, which is all fantasy. You know, he was a Middle Eastern, really dark guy that probably looked kind of strange to us, but, you know, we've Americanized him. So it's that picture of Jesus, and he's laughing. And the, this was the men, one of the ministers of the church, and he was just so perplexed that there was a <laughs> laughing Jesus. He just couldn't understand it. And, um, and I looked at him, and this is what I said. I said, well, you know, um, Nehemiah, I make sure I'm getting this right, Nehemiah 8.10, what that says in the Bible, Nehemiah 8.10, he said, I don't recall it. I, I said, well, it says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. He said, joy is happiness. I said, don't you think? That Jesus, who was so connected to his Father and his Creator, that he would be one of the most happiest people in the world? I mean, think about it. And then I start thinking about all the pictures that I saw of Jesus. He used to look like kind of upset or slightly constipated or something. I mean, when I was little, this, you know, there's this picture of Jesus. Anybody else have that experience? Jesus always looked somber or upset or his brow was, you know, you know, it was just so intense. And for me, that is one of the biggest gifts that I've gotten from Unity's teachings is to see the laughter in spiritual masters and to realize that, yes, there's times with our spiritual practice that's very serious, especially if there's serious circumstances in our life. But the title of the talk today is, This is Supposed to be Fun. This is Supposed to be Fun. Now, that doesn't mean that every moment of your life is just be laughing and skipping in the daisies. But I believe that our God nature, the part of us, the only part of us that's actually real, you realize that everything that you see, everything, even this mountain with the hard stone that it is, and every star in the sky, no matter how old it is, it is going to disappear and die. Everything we see here is temporary. Everything. But there is something that's not temporary. And that is the presence of God within you. It can't be taken away. It can't disappear. Sometimes people say they're looking for love, and I say, well, love is within you, and by the way, you can never be separated from love because you are actually love itself. You are love embodied. You are God embodied. And don't you think that this presence would be joyful and full of laughter and full of fun? So I really started taking an evaluation of my life to see how much of my day that I spend in joy. I, was, um, I don't really have a scientific mind, but I thought, wouldn't it be cool to patent something called the joy meter that you like stick to your forehead or wear it as glasses, and it calculates how many minutes of the day you're joyful and how many you're not? We'd probably be all upset at the end of a week to see how much time we didn't spend in joy. If we could really look at it and say, wow, you know, when you look at it cumulatively, we spend a lot of time worrying. And we know what worry is. Worry is using your powerful imagination to create something that you do not want. That's what worry is. So um, if anybody wants to co-create that uh, little thing with me, we'll get a patent and make a whole bunch of money. Yeah. <laughs> the joy meter. So I started looking at scripture. I started looking at ideas. I read a lot of the Fillmore's writings to see what they had to say about it. And Charles and Robert Fillmore, our co-founders, talked a lot about joy and about happiness. Um, everybody that's been in Unity a while knows the famous quote that Charles Fillmore had said when he was in his 90s that he would, um, uh, I don't remember the exact words, but he said, I get up every morning with z zeal. zeal. Yes. Sizzling. Sizzling with zeal, that's it, thank you. Sizzling with zeal to do what I ought to do. That sounds pretty joyous to me, right? I want to be 90 and doing that as well. So I started looking at um, just some examples of joy and um, one of the big examples that I found, a person whose life was profoundly affected by an attitude of joy, was a guy named Norman Peasants. You may have heard of him, but you might hand me my gator right there. For some reason, I'll get that. Thank you so much. Excuse me, talk amongst yourselves as I take a drink of this. <laughs> and it's sugar free. <laughs> so, Norman Peasants is a doctor, um, I think he did some work in neurology. And he wrote a book called Anatomy of an Illness. Some of you may have heard of this before. And um, I'm going to actually read some about him. My printer at home didn't work, so we're going to use the technology here. 
and so that I get his story exactly right just really shortly. He wrote a book called Anatomy of an Illness, and it was about um, him using laughter to heal himself of a very serious, debilitating, fatal illness. And he only used laughter. So it says, um, Norman Cousins did research on the biochemistry of human emotions, which he long believed were the key to human beings' success in fighting illness. It was a belief he maintained even as he battled, in 1964, a sudden onset case of a crippling connective tissue disease, which was also referred to as collagen disease. Excuse me. Experts at the rehabilitation clinic confirmed this diagnosis and also added ankylosidine spondylitis. It sounds horrible, whatever that is. He was told they had one chance in 500 of recovery. So what he did, he developed his own recovery program. Now, I love this kind of thinking. This reminds me of some people that I know in my life, and, and I want to be like this and model my, my life about this too. My mom was like this, and I know many others who, whatever the diagnosis says, it's like, well, that's just the doctor's idea. You know, statistics are just a bunch of numbers that someone else has experienced from the past. That has nothing to do with you. I don't ever even pay attention to statistics. Statistics are crazy. He didn't exactly at all, and he said um, he took massive intravenous doses of vitamin C, he had self-induced bouts of laughter, brought on by films of the television show Candid Camera and by very, various comic films. I heard in another, in his book he talks about, he watched I Love Lucy, the real funny old ones that are just, where you get that belly laugh going and you just laugh hysterically, and then watch Candid Camera. Remember how funny that show used to be? And so he did this for hours and hours and hours. Um, he also watched various comics with stand-up comics, his positive attitude was not new to him, however. He had always been an optimist, known for his kindness to others and his robust love of life itself. Quote, I made the joyous discovery that 10 minutes of genuine belly laughter had an anesthetic effect and would give me at least two hours of pain-free sleep. Like, belly laughter was his pain pill. That's something great to be addicted to, Be belly laughter. When the pain-killing effect of the laughter wore off, he would switch on the motion picture projector again, and not infrequently, it would lead to another pain-free interval. His struggle with that illness is detailed in the book, 1979 book, Anatomy of an Illness as Perceived by the Patient. And um, he did fully recover from his conditions, all of them, and went on to become a teacher of biochemistry and how he was one of the first pioneers teaching about biochemistry and how our emotions are directly connected to our body and how things develop within us. Now, we're kind of used to hearing that all the time now. I mean, if you read Louise Hay, you know, she even says if you're having this problem, it's probably related to this. It's not the exact science, but, you know, everything happens twice, we know. It happens first in our consciousness and our mind, and then it happens in our body. So by the time something gets to you, if it's a diagnosis or something, it's something that's been going on for a while. And so you have to get to the root of that problem. And if you read Louise Hay, her book, You Can Heal Your Life, you know this but back this, at this time in the 60s, this was a very new, crazy frontier. I mean, this was something that people had never heard of. This was a time when people believed the doctor as though they were God. But, you know, there was a time that was like that. My mom believed um, I was almost became the world's largest kidney stone. Because, uh, I mean, gallbladder stone, because my mom was told by the doctor after having three daughters that she could no longer have any children. She believed him totally. She didn't know. Well, she didn't know, but my dad was praying fervently to have a son because all he ever wanted was a son. So my mom, when she got into her 40s, she was told she couldn't have any more children, so she believed it fully. And even though she had had children before, she had a conditioned mind that believed the doctor, no questions asked. Now, she changed later in life. So there she is, and they tell her that she's got gall. She's having all these illnesses, and they say, you've got gallstones. So you're going to have to take them to surgery to get gallstones. So they do the pre-op blood work, and her, everyone is traumatized, and their mouths fall open. They said, you don't have gallstones. You have a baby. <laughs> and I like to say, I almost became the world's largest preaching, singing gallstone in the world. You know? But I tell that story that during this time when this happened to Norman Cousins, this was a new frontier. People did question the doctor. 
you know, they would say, well, you got three months to live. And it's interesting to go back and look at statistics because many times it was a self-fulfilled prophecy. Prophecy. People didn't, believe, didn't understand it was their own belief. Whenever the doctor said, you know, you're going to have six months to live, well, of course they're going to live six months because if you believe the doctor, you're, you're doing it. It is done to you as you believe. So Norman Cousins went on to write a lot of material about this. It's very, very fascinating how our emotions work together with our immune system, how everything works together. Even if we are carrying, and I'm not talking about emotions like, oh, in this moment I feel tired, or in this moment I'm joyful. I'm talking about those um, long-standing emotions that we are dragging with us that we don't even realize. For instance, we were abused as a child in some way, or we were hurt in a relationship, or anything like that. Um, we carry around some emotions that are sometimes stuffed down in there. And Norman did great research on that. I would suggest, if you're interested in this topic, to go and read some of his work. Because even though, as I said, we were used to hearing this, he had a really unique look on it because he was one of the first that took this seriously, what we now call the mind-body connection. And he realized that attitude, we hear that a lot. It almost sounds like a cliche, like, oh, you know, have a better attitude or whatever. But our attitude about situations really, really, really makes a difference. You know, I used to think that spiritual mastery was about manifestation, and it still is in some way. Um, and of course, many of us saw the secret, you know. I, I saw the secret at Walmart. Oh my goodness, when you're at Walmart, you've gone out to the realm beyond. So I know a lot of people have <laughs> saw the secret outside of, you know, metaphysical circles. And the, I love that. I love the movie, and I love that millions of people saw it. However, it kind of leaves you with the thing like, now what do we do? We have all this stuff, we manifest it, but everything off the vision board. And we got everything we made, we got the car, we got the hot, sexy partner that we wanted, and now, now what, you know? And what I believe is that's part of the power that you have within you if you want to create that in the world. I am more now about service, you know? You can move from that into service and how do you serve. But even beyond that, to me, the biggest sign of spiritual mastery is whenever you can have a great attitude and stay in a state of happiness no matter what the circumstances are, no matter what is happening. I mean, anybody can be happy when you feel good. Anybody's going to be excited when you win the lottery. I mean, that's a given, right? I hope that you'd be happy if you won the lottery. I mean, I don't know. Maybe you're like me, one of these crazy people. I don't know. But I mean, um, but um, our attitude and the way we react, that is the only thing that we have control of is how we react to circumstances in our life. Some things are just going to happen. We don't understand why. We don't understand how it could happen. But some things just are going to happen. And it's our response to those that tells us a lot about, scientifically, the biochemistry within us and how we're reacting and what kind of attitude do we have. You know, Jesus uh, maintained, I believe, this attitude of gratefulness no matter what happened to him. I don't think that he, although he questioned it, or the scriptures say that he did, um, as he began to go towards the crucifixion, like, you know, maybe, oh, maybe this isn't such a great idea, but I believe that the core of who he was, it didn't matter to him what happened in his life because he knew who he was. He knew who he was as spirit, as an expression of God. And he knew that no matter what they did to his body, that they could not destroy the essence of who he is. And that's why I talk about that during meditation, is that one of the things that brings me so much joy is to realize, especially as I get older, and, you know, my feet hurt sometimes after I leave the gym, and it aggravates me, and I say, when I was 20, I could stay on that treadmill for three hours. Well, I'm not 20 anymore, you know. Um, and I realize that um, as we get older, we begin to notice some of these things a little bit. But I plan to stay vibrant for as long as I can. And when I'm not vibrant, I'm out of here. Um, but our attitude, the joy that we have, has a lot to do, and how we respond to things has a lot to do with our well-being. It has a lot to do with how we feel during the day. It has a lot to do with whether we get sick or not, or just how we feel in general. And as I said, I would suggest um, reading some of uh, Norman Cousins to get more detail about that, his, um, his specific view about it. I just think about him, because I love to laugh. Anybody else here love to laugh? Okay. I have this um, video that sometimes I randomly show at, at our church, and we have a big screen. And I'll just be in the middle of a talk, and I'll tell the sound guy, like, hey, roll the video. And it's a guy dying of these sheep. 
and they're responding to him. And it's the funniest thing. You can't not laugh by seeing this. They go like, ah! and then he goes, ah! and then they all go, ah! and then he goes, ah! and then they go, ah! it's, it's the most stupid, funny thing. And we all, kind of like you're doing now, I've seen that, you start laughing. You know, it's just contagious. And how many of you have seen the video of the woman who is insane over her Chewbacca mask from Star Wars? Yes. Have you seen that one? Oh my goodness. I'll have to show that sometime. And she, this woman, is just overjoyed. She puts on this Chewbacca mask. When she comes out of the Walmart, in her car, and she videos herself saying, I'm going to put on this Chewbacca mask. And she's just laughing hysterically. And then when she puts it on, it starts going, <laughs> making Chewbacca noises, and that makes her laugh harder. You can't not laugh by seeing these things. And see how it feels, just that little bit of laughter, just telling us things. Do you feel that shift? You know, you just felt a little shift. Can you imagine Norman Cousins? And everybody thought he was crazy. He did this in the <laughs> hospital, too. I mean, he's rolling around on the floor laughing his behind off. And they're like, this guy's truly loony then. Well, they thought that until he got up there and walked out, you know, healed. <laughs> but um, we all have access to laughter. And I think it's just something we need to do more. I mean, would you agree? Yes. Yes. So is there something that maybe you could do this week to experiment and think, um, you know, I think this is really funny. I'm just going to go and just laugh, even if it's self-induced. Laugh for 30 minutes or an hour. Just force yourself to do it and see what kind of shift that you have. If you have a favorite show that makes you laugh, go online. Like, put in Chewbacca Mask Woman, and I promise it will come up. It's got millions of views. But put up Man Buying a Cheap or Questioning Cheap and just watch that. And for maybe 30 minutes, however much time you have, just experiment with that and see how much joy affects your life. Because I believe, as I said before, this is supposed to be fun. I mean, the Bible tells us over and over, why are you worrying? Why do you worry? Why? There is not one reason in the world to worry. The Bible even goes on to say that even these birds that are out here chirping and happy and these flowers bloom beautifully without any worry or... Um, even them having to do anything, but just be. They're just being, and everything is provided for them. Their food, a place to live, everything they need is right there. So that's the other beautiful thing. Even if you're not experiencing something, you know, a diagnosis or something, you can still laugh just to increase your well-being. There's no stop to it. You can keep going and going and going until your life is just one big happy party every single day. I mean, I believe that's what it's supposed to be like. Now, if you're far, far away from that, it's okay. We can only take one little step at a time. If you can't go to total joy if today you're really struggling with something, just see what you can think of just a little bit better than that. If you're feeling hopeless today, just think, maybe I can be grateful for something. Maybe I can look at the sunshine. Maybe I can be glad to have air conditioning in my heart. I mean, just think of something. And I do believe that energetically, if you're familiar with Abraham Hicks material, talks about it. Every emotion can lead to another emotion a little bit higher vibrating. And you can keep going. And there's no end to it. We can begin to vibrate at a level that's like a spiritual master so that we can just feel this joy. I believe that we should be overflowing with joy. Do you, Barry? You think that we should be happy? Should we be overflowing? We're going to get up and you guys are going to dance. I want you to dance. And come on, everybody stand up. Maybe you can lead us in this song. And um, we're going to feel some joy. We're going to dance. We're going to feel some love. Dance like nobody's watching. I don't think, are we filming today? Well, you saw he is watching. Oh, they're watching me. Oh, my goodness. All right, I'm going to get some down. So let's uh, dance around. Let's feel some joy and happiness and laughter as we sing together. Um, this one of my songs from my CD, Overflowing. Come on, y'all.
feel good. We are meant to be joyful. We are meant, the joy of the Lord really is our strength. And the joy of the Lord is just really you, your insights, who you are. That is your strength. The joy and the happiness is healing. It will actually heal your body. It can heal you if you have emotional issues. And so my prayer for all of us is that we stay in touch with this joyful nature that we really are and just become grateful to know. Because what I know about us is that we are all beautiful expressions of God, perfect. And we trust in the flow of the light that is always leading us to exactly where we need to be. We trust, we love, and we say, thank you, God. This is supposed to be fun, and thank you, God, for the joy in our lives. And so it is. Amen. Thank you.